It is T.K. Coleman, and I am not merely fighting for a society in which everyone feels free. I'm fighting for individuals who can figure out how to live free in any kind of society. I believe in that Bible verse, put not your trust in princes. So that's what I'm all about. So if you're looking for just another show, for somebody to talk to, talk to you about a concept of power that is located somewhere in a far off land, or are located somewhere outside of yourself, please hit the off button now. Please click away and go elsewhere. Well, maybe actually stay because this is what you need to hear. What's up, everybody? For those of you who have been tuning in, you know I appeared on the Minimalist podcast just a few days ago. A shout out to my brothers, Josh and Ryan over there. And we talked about a lot of different concepts related to the election, politics, voting, things along those lines. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some of those things that we discussed, but also just some of the things that are on people's mind right now as we are at this election day or election results day. So I have with me my brother Kamal, who is with me on every Wednesday. You all know Kamal, but I also have Sean Thunder Wallace today, Dr. Professor Sean Thunder Wallace, who uh, is with me every other week on Thunder and TK live stream. What's up brothers? How you guys doing? Hey, a meeting of the minds. Well, this is pretty well. cool. Yeah. So, so Kamal, I, I hear you're doing the uh, one of the things they talked about on the show. I, I think Josh said he's going to try to yep. see how long he can go w without finding out any kind of results or anything. So you're doing that experiment, too, right? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, especially working in the space that we work in, right? Like. Um, in this think tank space where we talk a lot about philosophy and politics and education and mm -hmm. economics and trying to stay tuned out, um, we're going to see like it's it's not even the results haven't actually come out yet. So things are working on my behalf. But yeah, I, coming into this call, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to make it out or not. Um, I know the topic here is what we talk, what you talked about on the minimalist as politics and voting. And so, yeah, I, I, I wanted to take on the personal challenge of trying to, trying to silo myself into the things that are important for my own development and, um, you know, what, what I'm really concerned about and what I'm invested in. And, and even last night, I think as the polls were going on, I had a friend uh, who was at my house and uh, he asked if he could watch it and I gave him the TV and then he asked if I was going to watch it. And I said, nah, man, like, um, you know, I did what I had to do. I, I, I cast my vote. But outside of that, like um, I at this moment, there's not much for me to do. Like, I, I what am I going to do? Sit in front of the TV and go through the emotional roller coasters of my candidate winning or losing, you know, for what? Like I and I, I think he ended up turning off and you know just knocked on my door and said hey man i think i'm gonna take one out of your book um because if x candidate loses i'm gonna be really upset and i just don't need to to get all distraught and just pissed off um it's not really productive so i'm just gonna go to sleep and i'll just find out in the morning so that's kind of the the place and space i'm coming from is is that um either way it goes if you voted you're gonna have some level of investment into what the outcome is going to be, and it's emotional roller coaster, and and some people like that. Some people like the thrill of of knowing whether or not you know the person that they bet on is going to win or not. But for me, if that person loses or if that person wins, you know, the day after November fourth, or yeah, I think today's the fourth, yeah, whatever that's going to be, it's not going to change how I get up, what my morning routine is, the work that I'm doing at my job. Um, and there's just no point in me really getting emotionally invested in that and sitting in front of the, t the TV. And so I took the challenge. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's see how long I can, uh, insulate myself from the noise. Yeah, man. I love that. You know, one of my big themes personally is never confuse emotion with ethics, never confuse mood with, with morality. And it can be really easy to conflate having a strong emotional response to something with actually caring. And so when you look at people who seem to be more composed or more nonchalant or who tune out and say, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna protect 
my emotions right now. I'm going to protect my mental health. It can be easy to look at those people as like, oh, well, you're irresponsible. But like you said, whether you voted or didn't vote, that's it now. They're counting the results, but that's it. Your emotional response, whether it be one of glee or gloom, is not a going not going to affect what the outcome is going to be. And, and I think it's very interesting because we live in a culture that that almost makes people think they are being weak if they don't take advantage of every opportunity to either get into a fight or exhibit passion in some kind of way. And I think about this verse in the Bible that is a guiding principle in my life. And it says, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the wellsprings of life. You know, your, your feelings are a force of nature and your feelings are very valuable. You are not to be guided by them in all things, but you are to harness those feelings are as, as a kind of creative fuel that can that can give you the energy to create the things that matter most to you. And if you're just squandering your feelings left and right over every tweet that's stated, every uh, news story that's shared, every update that's shared, and you don't know how to unplug, you don't know how to take a break, you don't know how to liberate your mind from the constant barrage of external stimulation, you will not be in control of your state and if you're not in control of your state, you're not in control of your life. You know what I mean? One of the things I want to do, guys, is I want to I want to hit up some of the questions and moments from this minimalist podcast and get you guys' thoughts on it. So we we kicked off the podcast with a question from one of their viewers, and I want to go ahead and and uh, and play that and, and talk a little bit about the nature of the system. And um, yeah, is the is this system that we're in broken? And we have a question so from Elizabeth. Is this really the best we have to offer, or is the system so broken that the best and brightest are excluded from political leadership because responsible, conscientious, ethical people are eliminated early on, or simply can't afford the outrageous budget required to compete as a candidate? Here's my pithy answer for you all, and then I'll let you unpack it here. A corrupt system does not make room for the truth. Let me hear from you, fellas. I'm going to start with you, Dr. Thunder. Is this system broken? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> it's still the greatest system in the world, but it's also riddled with, you know, uh, artifacts and remnants of humanity. And so we have certain tendencies and certainly uh, our political system is not uh, immune to the effects you know of those of those tendencies you know the two party thing uh, I find particularly problematic because and this may sound a little bit like a conspiracy theory but I think there's a lot of truth so I see the two parties is basically being two sides of the same coin. And the polarity is necessary in order to keep both parties in power, right? So if I say uh, I have XYZ issue you know, I need a solution. Okay, I'm going to vote for the other guy that doesn't have XYZ issue. Of course, they have another list of issues, right? But they don't have XYZ issues. Now, what ends up happening, since a lot of these politicians are buddy buddy behind the camera, um, behind the camera, when they're not in front of the camera, in other words, um, is you're still keeping your friends close. I mean, there's all these think tanks, there's all these other ways to stay involved in politics. I mean, you can become a lobbyist, you know, there's like a million ways to profit if you're, even if you're not in elected office, as long as you occupied a, an elected office at, at one time. 
as far as the way that this interacts with the black community, which is something that I'm particularly concerned and interested in, um, my view, I'm, I'm a third party uh, voter. My view is actually, I, I believe that like O'Shea Duke Jackson uh, has said uh, that we need a we need a third party. We need a black party. Because hmm. uh, these uh, politicians, they don't seem particularly interested in uh, particularly interested in our issues. And they don't even court us. They don't even try to talk to us. Other groups, at least, they make deals with. But they don't seem to make deals with us. Um, if you look at what happened with Ice Cube recently, uh, so this uh, contract with Black America, which is, uh, I think it's great. Uh, so he's gotten, you know, pegged as being some kind of, you know, Trump, you know, aligned or, you know, Trump supporter or whatever. But actually, that was never that was never really the case. Uh, he wanted to talk to both both sides. Both sides reached out to him. One side said that they would talk before the election and they actually got stuff down on paper and and made some quantifiable uh, you know, assessments. Now, if they're going to follow through and do what they said or not, that's a different issue. Right. But at least Trump was with uh, Trump's team would actually sit down with them and they created what's called the platinum plan. Right. Uh, Democrats wouldn't even talk to him. You know, they wouldn't even talk to him until after the, you know, after the election. I mean, they, you know, they they reached out to him initially, but they wouldn't actually talk substantively about the issues, you know. Um, so. So now he's like pigeonholed as some kind of, you know, Trump, you know, supporter, mm -hmm. some kind of, you know, sellout and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, dude, that has nothing to do with it. He just wanted to have the conversation, <laughs> you know, and, and he was willing to talk to whoever was in power. That's that's something that as a black community we have to deal with. We have to be willing to talk to whoever's in power, even if it makes it look like we're, you know, signing on with the wrong team. <laughs> I got. I want to hear your response to this with regards to the Ice Cube thing. So, one of the criticisms I've heard of that is, "Look, man, you can talk to whoever you want. Ain't no problem with that." But the question is not who are you having a conversation with, but what are the real results beyond just the optics that are being had as a result of this conversation? And so, what what many people are saying is that. He fell for the okie doke by handing Trump on a silver platter an easy photo op, an easy photo op of like, look, Trump is having conversations with black folks about black issues when in reality, nothing is actually going to get done that helps black people. And so the power move for Cube would have been to withhold that convenient and luxurious and profitable photo op from Trump until after the election, where if you're really interested, you're gonna have the conversation and, and, and you have nothing to gain from the convo unless you achieve real results. I'm curious as to what's your response to that. After, after the election, they don't need us. At least if you make a promise, mm -hmm. then you have some kind of leverage. You can say, hey, but you made this promise. And then of course you can say, well, politicians lie all the time. That's true, you know, but at least the willingness to actually come up with some quantifiable, you know, uh, you know, numbers. They, I mean, there's actual numbers associated with this platinum plan. Now look at what they had on the other side of this, on what the Democrats had. They have a bunch of things listed, uh, how they are gonna black, uh, help the black community, but notice that none of them are quantifiable. There's no way to measure <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to measure if any of those things have happened or not, you know. Uh, so that's you know that's that's kind of part of my issue, you know. Another part of my issue with the with the way that the system is, is uh, there's this constant, you know, issue of if you're if you're a, you know, a third party voter, 
then you're voting for then you, you know that's a vote for Biden or if you're a third party voter that's a that's a vote for Trump and first of all it's like now which one is it is it a vote for Biden or is it a vote for Trump it certainly can't be both a vote for Biden and Trump if I if I you know choose to vote for the libertarian or something you know it's like the, the uh, Schrodinger the cat just of, of voting yeah it just doesn't work that way <laughs> yeah hey uh Kamal I want to hear from you man is the system broken you know I as somebody who doesn't place a lot of equity in the system um a little challenging for me to weigh in on this um I I, I think that you know oftentimes DK you talk about this and and I, I like this approach but that that the system and that politics is a lagging indicator of what we do on an individual level. And, and I'd like to think of it in that regard and, and place more of place more of the responsibility on the people versus the system. Um, I, I, I think it's, I think my, I, I guess I just don't like the belief that a certain system um, is going to dictate everything that I do. And in and, 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 and history, there are societies where that is very much the case, right? Um, and I think that, you know, what we have kind of like Thunder said is is the best in the world in terms of like, I mean, the, the liberties in which we already have, I think, pale in comparison to a lot of other places in the world. But with that being said, like, again, as somebody who places more faith in myself and my own potential than what the system is going to be able to provide for me. I'm less concerned about, you know, really investing hard into the system as opposed to investing in people who are going to build systems. Because I think the systems that people go out and build and that they contribute to are, are just a reflection of themselves. And, and you know, something that I, I, I do find very, very interesting about the current system is the polarization. And I think the way that these elections have gone, it, it, it seems like it's 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 a sport, you know. Like if my team is the Lakers, then I obviously have an issue with the Celtics. Um, and I think the same is very true with this. I, I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and you know, walking down the main strip, and there's like foam fingers in the the windows. This candidate or that candidate. You know, it's they had jerseys and foam fingers and flags. And and I think, you know, wearing a Trump shirt, I think, signals something. Um, and I think a lot of people really identify with that. And 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 in, from a marketing aspect, because this is my job and and I am I'm able to look at it objectively. I think it's genius. Like, I, I, I think the polarization is what what is so effective. But at the same time. You know, running our running our government like like um, like a sports league. To me, it, I don't know. I I, I I don't think that it it, um, it it's the most effective way to do it. But at the same time, I see that it works and that it's very effective in, in getting people to buy into this party, getting people uh, to give that, you know, unquestioning faith where they're just going to vote you know, Republican or Democrat straight down the ballot for everybody um, in that party. And I, and I think that's valuable. And I think the tactics that are employed are only employed in order to keep the powers that be in power, right? And I think that if individuals really started to recognize that by putting more power and more effort into the system, it, it's a continuous cycle. And it, it's going to continue to feed itself. And I think, you know, true power at least for me, and I think for our audience that we're trying to talk to, really, really does lie within. Mm. I love that, brother. You know, for me, I think the biggest sign of a broken system is when the intelligence and integrity of people is mocked for questioning that system. Because the only way that you can encourage innovation and flourishing in any society is to encourage a healthy dosage of skepticism. 
to teach people to think critically and creatively about all things, including the system of which they are a part. To never deify a system so much in the name of nationalism or patriotism or any other kind of ism that you see it as sacrilegious, as blasphemous to question the system. Because anything that is true, anything that is good, anything that is worth holding on to can stand the test of scrutiny. And if you're holding on to something and you don't believe that it can stand up to questioning, to analysis, then that means you're not really confident in what it is you're holding on to. And so I think we need to encourage exactly what Kamal was talking about. And it's exactly why I spend so much time talking about this idea of voting for yourself and placing faith in what you can do 365 days of the year. This is not a mere form of pacifism. This is not a mere form of, 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 of weekly tuning out, but it's actually based on an understanding of how systems work. We, we often approach systems in the same way that we approach success. We tend to focus only on the big dramatic moments without thinking about all the non-dramatic everyday steps that led up to it. So you take sports, for instance, the Super Bowl, game seven of the NBA finals, the game winning shot, the game winning home run. Those are the moments that have the biggest audience. But you don't get to even be in that position to take a game winning shot or to to make a big play unless you do a lot of things that people aren't going to praise you for, like showing up to practice on an ordinary Tuesday, hitting the weight room when you don't feel like it at 5 a.m. Wednesday morning when there won't be an audience member there to give you an applause. Those are the things that actually win championships. The game winning shot is just a manifestation of the everyday preparation that preceded it. And when it comes to the system of politics in this country, we, we come alive as a country during the big dramatic moments. We, we get preachy for the first time, for the only time, about getting up, getting out there and doing your part when it comes to showing up to a voting both booth. And then we just kind of disappear once the results are all counted up, we, we either cry or we celebrate, then we kind of disappear and we go back to this lifestyle of not really holding each other accountable to becoming smarter, to becoming more economically useful, to becoming more valuable in our relationship, to becoming better fathers, be better brothers with one another, better everything that we need to be. And until we make those kinds of changes, you know, at the level of education, at the level of personal development, then we're gonna keep getting to these dramatic moments and having the same sort of frustrating results because we're thinking about systems as we do success, just in terms of dramatic moments, rather than the everyday boring, non-glamorous responsibilities that it takes to get good results. You know, uh, something I, that- I, I, um, Can I add a little bit something? Go ahead, go ahead, Thunder, go ahead. Uh, so this is just kind of putting some rubber on the road. Of course, I, I agree with everything yeah. you, both of you said. Um, you know, <laughs> the the whole kind of the drudgery doing doing the the stuff that nobody's paying attention to. Um, yeah. The willingness to do that stuff consistently. That's what produces actual greatness actual greatness right so you know yesterday and today i mean i, I voted you know I, I got my vote on and everything um uh, today you know I, I was in the gym yesterday and i was in the gym today and guess what if biden wins i still gotta lift the weight and if trump wins I still got to lift the weight. Matter of fact, when Obama won, I still hated leg day and I still <laughs> had to go in and, and get legs in, you know, and the weight I was doing was was the same weight. It wasn't any lighter, <laughs> you know. So uh, there is that really kind of day to day thing. And now I'm being hyperbolic here. And but the the, the fact is, is that uh, like I was saying, you know, you have these two parties and it's like two sides of the same coin. Because if you actually look at uh, actual policy, we may experience, if Biden gets in, we may experience about a 3% difference in policy. Okay. <laughs> so, 
So it seems to me to be like a lot of like struggling in a lot of emotion involved in something that's going to have a very minute impact on uh, our day to day. Right. But the very same people that, you know, are crying that the sky is falling and if we don't get this guy in here, it's going to be the worst thing in history and all this kind of stuff. Many of them are also the ones that are struggling to, you know, to make a gym appointment consistently or to you know consistently do anything daily to make themselves better to make them an actual contributor to society and don't get me talking about uh, uh, about the fact that you know you got you know everybody oh you know vote and if you don't vote then you're some kind of slum lord whatever but the actual power in government as far as accessing government in our system I mean, it, it's not really the vote. It's contacting your representative. You know, it's it's making your you know your grievance known. It's sharing those ideas. It's having those conversations, um, sharing that information. That's actually the real power in our form of government. And notice that people are all about telling us that we're you know that we need to vote and we need to X, Y, and Z. But then nobody is telling telling us to contact our our representatives because really the politicians want to get in there however they get in there and just be able to do whatever they want so anyhow that's a, that's that's bonus i guess what what i'd like to <laughs> jump in on is is something that a guest of ours in the past brought up and, and it's the topic of voting you know on the minimalist episode tk you guys talked about whether it's okay not to vote you know um is it okay for people to do that and and i think one of the things that really uh changed the way i thought about voting is what our past guest former governor governor maybe he was a former candidate for governor of new york uh larry sharp um he came on the show and, and he he talked about that whether you decide to vote or not um if if the government is wants to take your house they will take your house and if you try to stop them they will kill you and and the way that he illustrated the point is that whether whether or not you are involved decisions are going to be made for you and it's whether the so the question comes down to are you going to participate in the decisions that are being made or are you just going to let some detached and removed majority decide or or not even majority but detached and removed personnel decide what's going to happen for you so I, i'd love to kind of hear your take on that tk because essentially his point is that if you're not voting if you're not weighing into the decision then you're allowing other people to make that choice for you yeah so I definitely believe that statement is flawlessly true when it comes to reality itself. It's not possible to simply divorce yourself from reality and to the and, and ignore the forces and factors that affect our quality of life just because you don't like heated discussions or you don't like controversy or you don't like complexity. The fact of the matter is people will affect you by the choices they make. A good example of this would be let's take religion. You can be an atheist and you cannot believe in the existence of God. And you can even be right about the fact, but there's no change in the fact that you live in a world with religious people and religious people are going to make decisions on the basis of those beliefs. And you simply cannot afford to ignore that. You have to figure out how to think strategically about what role you're going to play in fighting for the kind of society that you that you live in. So every one of us needs what I would call a political philosophy meaning that you need a well-developed worldview about your theory of social change, the role that politics does and does not play in that theory of social change, and what your level of conscious participation should be. If you're going to be like me and question or criticize or be an atheist towards the political system, you need to make sure you're doing that because you've done your own research, you've thought things through, and you're making a decision consciously based on evidence, not based on, oh, these questions are hard and I don't like getting into fights. So for me, and I've given talks about this elsewhere, I believe in an entrepreneurial theory of social change. 
I believe that where we actually get innovation from, where we actually get, get change from, is from the creative power of individuals as expressed through art, through innovation, through creativity, and through entrepreneurship, through technology, through science. I believe that what politics does is it comes afterwards, as you mentioned earlier, that lagging indicator. And it tends to be the thing that occupies people's mind, but I believe that we confuse the cause and effect. We get the politics that we deserve. We get the kind of government that we deserve. It is typically a reflection of our own consciousness, a reflection of our own sense of power, a reflection of our own beliefs, so to speak. But I, I don't believe that is the starting point. So for me, I tend to devote my energies towards that which I take to be the starting point. So I, I, I don't have a sufficient amount of time with the 15 minutes we have left to go into my overall theory of the system, but I'll leave it at this and say, I absolutely reject the picture of the system that is presented to us. And I believe it's far more like the Hunger Games than what mainstream media is telling us. And I, I simply do not believe that our power is in the direction where we're pointed. I believe the direction where we're pointed is a direction that is designed to keep the powers that be in business. I believe power is in the opposite direction of where we're pointed. And so I choose to focus on that and point other people in that direction because that's the thing that hardly anyone is going to talk about in juxtaposition with politics in the way that you hear me talking about it here. Thunder, you look like you're over there thinking, man. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to dig, I want to dig down into this, uh, third party vote thing again. Uh, and, uh, so this is a post from my Facebook, uh, and this was, uh, prior to the 2016 election and uh, I'll just, I'll just read it. So a vote for anyone other than Donald Trump is a vote for Hillary Clinton. No, <laughs> you've heard this a lot by now. This is a false statement, but it's persuasive well, for I, many I pulled votes. Up, I pulled up the, the at length quote, and I think this will be cool for the audience to hear if you're going to riff on it. And it, it's the Go one ahead. that begins with just, I think you posted this because okay, so you're referencing what you posted in 2012, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. You say here, just the thought. Since we are approaching the presidential election to continue to support and vote for the lesser of two evils in the end only serves to promote evil. Voting against someone is not equivalent to voting for someone or something that you actually believe in. And the popular idea that you are wasting your vote by not voting for one of the typically corrupt major party choices is false. America is not a monolithic or dualithic society. So two parties are not sufficient there are some worthy third party candidates. Yeah, you know, and uh, what I'm, what I'm, uh, what I'm getting into, it, you, you know, there's a, there's a, okay, so there's this thing that, that it seems like the general person, like if you were to stop 10 people on the street, it seems like the general person, maybe nine out of 10 of them, almost wouldn't even be aware of any third party candidates. And that's because I think that the media has done a masterful job at creating this competition sort of atmosphere where it's much more profitable for them to make it seem like there are two front runners and they'll bat battle it out for supremacy, right? It's the final day you know, it, it's it, it, it's sort of the same reason why the Super Bowl is such a big event, right? It's the last two, right? And when they battle it out, then you, you know, whoever wins, that's, you know, they're the best, right? It's like the best of the and best. So there's yeah. that kind of, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's that kind of, uh, I think, energy uh, that's, uh, that, that, uh, uh, the media takes advantage of, takes full advantage of. So, uh, 
so that's a but that's a problem because of this whole playing into the lesser of two evils because everyone's willing to say yeah politicians are not perfect politicians lie politicians this and that you got to hold them accountable you don't know what they're actually doing you know all of this i mean people people have these thoughts but they're still willing to still play play the game they're still willing to uh vote for the same you know same folks over and over and over um, and they think that they are doing something positive by playing into this lesser of two evils sort of narrative and uh, uh, th there is no such thing as lesser of two evils uh, you you end up just promoting evil um you have to be willing to i mean i like something that i saw you say uh tk on the minimal minimalist podcast where uh it was something about a <laughs> a, a certain flavored milkshake and uh, you you want to? I'll, I'll say it. Uh, I'll say it. Here. It was the piss yeah. milkshake and the shit sandwich. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and 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 this is essentially our our binary political system in a nutshell. You've got two options: the piss milkshake or the shit sandwich. And we're gonna sit here and watch you talk yourself into something that is completely absurd because it's not worse than because it's not as bad as the other thing rather than walking out of the restaurant and demanding some self-respect before you spend your money there. Right. And, and you, you uh, went into it a little bit further when you said, you know, uh, restaurants are not going to change, you know, if, if they know that you're going to still go there and just choose one of the terrible options, you have to be willing to walk. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the restaurant analogy is a good one because an objection that a person could make is, well, yeah, well, what if what if you're the only one that leaves and the restaurant looks at you and says, ah, we don't need that guy's business. That's actually a likelihood. So you may need more people to think like you. But how do you get more people to think like you? You have to be willing to be first. You have to be willing to stand alone. It reminds me of that movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where Someone criticized him and told him that he's fighting for a lost cause. And he said, the only cause is worth fighting for all the lost ones. We don't need to fight for the other causes. These are the only that are worth fighting for. Anyone that truly initiates change has to exercise the courage to start a revolution of one. You got to be willing to go first. You got to be willing to live on the edge. You know, another thing with this two party system is I think one way you know that you are living in a system of control is when all the important conversations around the system are designed in such a way to exclude the voices that speak with the courage of one who has nothing to lose. So we had Larry Sharp on our show and the brother was dropping a lot of dimes and I watched his campaign for governor of New York. He was saying so many interesting, innovative things. He was making so many challenges, but guess what? That brother wasn't in the main stage debate. They never are, by the way. They never are. That's right. Because because the narrative we're sold is, well, they have no legitimate chance of winning. But I'll tell you what the truth is. The truth is the general public will have an opportunity to hear a position and to hear a set of questions that neither of those two are are, are, are really prepared for. Because it's sort of mm -hmm. like, like Macho Man and Hulk Hogan in the ring together. They, they agree on what the rules are. They're pretty much the same. It's just the red versus the blue. And they got their talking points and they're prepared for each other. But... In politics, we never get a chance to see the Denver Nuggets pull off an upset against the Clippers because in politics, the way it works is, nope, it's going to be the Clippers or the Lakers. You don't get to see anything else. We already picked who's going to be in the finals. And you don't get a chance to see and, those upsets. But what would happen those to the way people built for each other? I was just going to say those teams are built for each other. Yep, 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 yep. yep. By the way, the, the, if I can go there, I think the Clippers would have performed much better against the Lakers. They might have lost still, but they would have performed better against the Lakers because they were built for the Lakers. They weren't prepared for the Nuggets because they they didn't have to really think about the Nuggets. You know what I mean? But but you get different results when you're in a system where you're not artificially protected from the little guy, from the outlier, from from the people that can challenge you with tough questions. It's it's similar to being a celebrity 
and insulating yourself from the man on the street that's capable of giving you some criticism from real talk and you just surround yourself with people that, you know, that tell you what you want to hear. Hey, I'm going to play, no. I want to play Go ahead. Go ahead. a clip from my final moment. Um, Kamau, are you going to say something? Uh, I mean, no, go ahead. I, I want to hear this final clip and I'll weigh in. I'm going to play a clip from this final moment because the Minimalist podcast, you should check it out. I was there with uh, Jamie Kilstein and and Kim Iverson. And, 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 we, and we talked in for about, it's about a 40 minute episode. And we just kind of talked about the voting, the election. And both of them have some pretty interesting things to say as well. I thought it was a great conversation. And then there is a Maximalist episode for the Patreon subscribers. I'm going to play a clip from uh, a moment that I had on the Maximalist episode because um, I'm a proud and passionate non-voter, an unapologetic non-voter. But here's what I had to say about that for those who maybe wonder about my position and, and where I come from a little bit. Then I want to hear you guys riff on it. So this is uh, my final clip I want to play, my final thoughts from the Maximalist episode. You know, I, I want to say something really quickly about my, my non-voting position and the implications for anybody that's listening and might be influenced by my beliefs on this. I want to make a distinction between having an opinion and having a mission. Mm. An opinion is a stance that you take on a particular issue based on how you see things. A mission refers to the agenda or the aim that you're fighting for in life, the battle that defines your life. I've got a lot of opinions about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Josh and I have talked on the phone and just argued at great length about LeBron versus Jordan, right? <laughs> and my opinion is that Jordan is the GOAT, LeBron isn't even close, but that opinion is not indicative of my mission. I'm not on a mission to convince everyone Destroy that LeBron Jordan James. is better than LeBron. <laughs> right, right. It, it, like I'm totally comfortable with a world where the majority of people disagree with me on that and think that LeBron is the best ever. It doesn't mm -hmm. affect me at all, mm -hmm. you know? But that's my opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. When it comes to politics, my opinion is that the real powers that control this world are not politicians. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah. And my opinion is that this system is set up in such a way to pacify us, to give us a sufficient amount of participation mm. so that we feel like we are responsible yeah. for the things that happen but to also keep us from being so angry yeah. that we rebel in a way that's really threatening to the corruption of the system. I agree with that's that. my opinion. I don't believe in this system and I do not validate it. Mm. Mm. I, I do believe the kingdom of God is within us and our efforts are best spent in actualizing our potential, making ourselves better. My mission, however, is not to sell people that. If you vote and it makes you feel better, it makes you feel like you're involved, I'm not gonna be the guy at the voting booth trying to tackle you or hold you down or tell you that you're not a good person, okay? <laughs> My mission in life is to convince people to have more faith in themselves than in politicians. Mm, yeah. I remember at a press conference, LeBron was talking about all the criticism and hate that people direct at him. And one of the things he said is, no matter how much hate you direct at me, when you wake up in the morning, you're still gonna be you. Mm. All the problems that oh, you had, so you're still gonna have them, right? And my contention is that when you wake up in the morning after election day, you're still going to be you. And right. so the most important question and is you're not. Saying, let me let me just uh, add on to that. So let you continue. Yeah. You're saying that regardless of who wins, regardless of who wins, even if it's the person you really love yep. and like, this is the person I was knocking door to door for. Yeah, your life is still your life. Yeah, your life is still your life. And so for me, the most important question we should be asking ourselves is not who am I going to vote for every four years, but mm -hmm. rather what am I going to do between the day after election day yes. and the next election day? Yes. Right. If your answer to that question is, well, I'm going to celebrate, man, because my favorite candidate won and now the world's going to magically get better. Mm. You're doing it wrong. You're right. doing it wrong. And if your answer to that question is, well, I guess I'm going to sit around and wait for four more years until I can get the right person in office. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. The right answer to that question is I'm going to spend the next 364 days practicing creative activism as a lifestyle, taking my power as an individual seriously and developing my skills, developing my mindset and creating the kind of change that will actually last because pol political change is just a delayed response to the things that we do on an individual level to invest in our community. So, Damn it, this I, is Jamie Kilstein saying don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a bitch. No, I Hey man, first, first I just gotta burn you up, man. 
<laughs> hey man, I, I, you know, I did what I was supposed to do. You know, the ancestors, <laughs> the ancestors, man. You didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> you pull out, you pull out the access to the army. Now say something. Now say something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, for me, that clip speaks for itself. I've had my say. I want to hear from you guys. All right. Well, I mean. I mean, I, I I can't say I disagree with anything uh, that you said. Um, uh, what really is most important is what you as an individual are doing day in, day out. It's like I said uh, earlier, the weights that I'm going to be lifting. So I, I have a, on my, uh, on my Instagram and on my Facebook, I have this, uh, it's a it's a series of videos and, and pictures that I've been putting up detailing my progress towards uh, you know the road to a 430 pound bench press okay so it doesn't really matter who wins it doesn't really matter what other issues you know are challenging me in my life if I don't get to the gym consistently there's no way I'm going to get to that 4:30. It's just not going to happen. And my long range goal is actually I'm trying I'm chasing 500, but I got to get to 4:30 before I can get to 500, right? And it's the same thing with with all of the things uh, that I do that mean something that are important. You know, it's the consistency of time and effort that I put into them. Mm. It's not the you know one time event. And then, okay, now let's just let's just hang out. It's actually one of the issues that I have with uh, an aspect of the Protestant conception of salvation, that it's somehow a one-time event, and um, either you're saved or you're not saved, and you're not going to know if you're part of that number or not, you know. But <laughs> but you know, it's either on or off. Whereas the the early church approach to this, uh, this this whole, you know, you know, push and press to the to, to the end, you know, because that's where salvation is. It's a it's a it's a process. It's a growing every day. It's a working out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, it's the the acts. You know the, the you know the the the, the uh, <clears throat> you know all of the things that we participate in over the course of the of the church calendar they matter the fasting matters because it's producing something in you it's leading you to salvation you know being married or not married it matters because it's either celibacy or marriage that is leading to salvation. All of this mm. stuff is mm. coming together. And yes, of course, Jesus is the central figure. And of course, Jesus is what, who made this possible. But the way that we experience salvation is through, it's, it's through the sacraments in the church. It's through this community. But all of it started, yes, with Jesus. But it's a process. It's not a one, you know, it's not a, um, you know, one and done kind of proposition. Anything that yep. actually means something in life is not a one. Yep. Oh, I just did it once. Hey, I got my vote on. I'm tight. Hey, I got my virtual signal, you know, signaling sticker. You know, I put my I put my picture on Facebook. You know, now I'm done. And now I also have evidence that I did it. So whenever I get in discussion. I can always go back to that picture and you can see that, hey, I'm an active voter. You know, that is yeah. just not, uh, that ain't it. It's all of the stuff that happens after the election, you know, uh, that, that actually matters. Yeah. Yeah. Without jumping on the same bandwagon, because I think that's what this whole conversation has been. It, it's been in that direction. But I think taking a different direction, I think something that 
influences me to carry and approach the system the way I do, to, to carry my life in the way I do, is, is that I have given myself permission and I continue to give myself permission on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, to ignore the things that aren't in alignment with my values. And if I am not aligned mm. with a system that is placing power elsewhere, then I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give it attention. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give that power. I'm not gonna channel my electricity into this to, to create energy elsewhere. And I think there's a certain liberation that comes with knowing you're who you're investing in. Like last night, I, I, I did a monthly reflection of everything that happened in October. Um, what were the lessons I learned? What is my plan of action going forward? I took that power back. I, I've, I easily could have sat there and vegged out in front of the TV. Um, and again, you know, the, the team sport direction that politics has gone, I get it. I get it. You want to see your team win. I understand. But this whole this whole going this whole touching like on these two candidates you know the shit sandwich and piss milk shake i don't want to vote for either one of those teams and a lot of times <laughs> the values that they stand for aren't even in alignment with what i'm trying to do so i got to be free to ignore that i i got to understand that i that my um my attention my energy is valuable and i i know it's valuable I, I know it's going to be the biggest contributor of where I'm trying to go. Um, that needle isn't moving forward unless I'm unless I'm trying to push it. And so, you know, I think from this whole conversation, but from that last point especially, I, I'm just a big believer in in the liberation and freedom that people need to give themselves to ignore the things that aren't in alignment with their values. Yeah, and you know, uh, you know along the you know part of part of getting to this 430 pound bench press is i got to eat certain things and, and choose not to eat other things and it sounds like a crap sandwich in a in a piss milkshake those, those probably won't help me achieve that goal so i'll sign out even if it's just for that reason <laughs> <laughs> so, so i'll i'll close with uh with reading something here and then issuing out a challenge to our audience that I think is in, in keeping with the spirit of this conversation. So this comes from an article I wrote called The, the Greatest Conspiracy. And um, I said here that the greatest danger isn't that too many people will fail to show up at the voting booth. The greatest danger is that too few people will ever take themselves seriously as creative forces. What concerns me isn't the fact that we uh, what scares me isn't that my neighbor might vote for the wrong person. What scares me is that my neighbor probably defines power in a way that makes his existence relevant, his existence relevant only when he's voting for someone other than himself. And someone reshared last night something that I wrote the last election. And uh, I said, I hope you don't stop encouraging people to make a difference after tonight. I hope you don't make the mistake of believing that your political vote was your one big chance to make a difference in the world. My challenge to people, and I'm willing to challenge myself and be held accountable to this challenge. My challenge to you is the same energy, y'all. Keep that same energy. I have heard so many of my friends, my families, people that I haven't heard from in a long time, all y'all have shown up and been very vocal about your opinions regarding what other people need to do as part of some responsibility that they have to make the world a better place. Keep that same energy, y'all. Don't disappear now. Don't flake now. Don't pull a no call, no show now. You've already exercised the boldness and the courage to be like, hey, you need to be doing this. Now just do that for working out, do that for healthy eating, do that for reading and learning new things, do that to your friend that you know that's been talking a bunch of stuff about how they want to write a book, do that to that friend of yours that's like, oh, I've been wanting to write, uh, start a business, but they've been procrastinating for two months. Keep that same energy. Let's not just challenge each other when it's dramatic and the whole world is synchronizing on this specific topic. Let's challenge each other all the time because that's the only way that we actually get a better world. Peace out, y'all. Thanks, brothers, for joining, man. This was a fun convo.